Okay, so the recording's going. Um, all right, so here we are. Um, there's a few things I need to work on, honestly, for you guys uh, for our class. Just a few cleanup things uh, that I need to do. Um, but let's let's spend a minute um, going over like, well, what do we have left to do? I know I have some some grades. I've been plugging away at those, but I'm a little bit behind. A lot of you guys have done a lot of great stuff. You can see there's been nothing new for a while. When does our class actually end? Well, it actually ends here in May. So let me change over to May. And I, I need to kind of get these things cleaned up uh, for you guys. Because the, the semester ends May 19th. And so what I'm going to do is move all that stuff and stick it on on the 19th, okay? But I wanted to go over like, what, what do I have for you? And what are some of the things I'm working on um, as far as your grades? And give me just a second here. I'm gonna do something real quick. So, all right. Just taking a quick um, capture. All right, um, let's see. Get the get my drawing tools up. All right. So um, uh, for the for the most part, um, you know, like there's a lot of stuff that that we've done so far. Some of the stuff like the um, CDX Pro work and and all that stuff. I'm gonna move. Uh, a lot of that stuff's optional stuff, and I'm moving it all to the end of the semester. Um, I just took a screenshot so I can kind of do attendance so that I can put that in there with your extra credit Zoom points. I need to put those in. So a lot of you guys that are with me tonight have also uh, spent time with me do on Zoom throughout the semester. And so I just want you guys to know that I'm putting all those things together. Now, some of these things... Um, you know, they were assignments and I quite frankly, I just couldn't fit them all into the eight weeks. So I, what I'll do is I'll flip some of these over and make them extra credit uh, opportunities, whether it's um, measuring your current through a fuel pump or um, discussing some advanced meter stuff. Uh, obviously, you have extra credit like the CDX Pro work activity because I didn't want you to have to buy CDX, but if you, you have it. If you bought it for other classes, it's certainly a great activity to do. Um, we'll clear out some of those drawings. Um, anyways, so so all this stuff will be condensed. If I go back to that calendar, I'm going to condense this stuff and, you know, make it due to the end of the semester so you guys can kind of finish things up uh, at your own pace. OK, now, speaking about your own pace, if I go back to our course and I jump in to the modules, <clears throat> essentially what we have, um, what we have uh, left um, is some things like the, um, the actual um, final exam for the class. And I I'm gonna go over that here in a minute. Um, we have things like the CDX Pro work, which I was just showing you. But the big thing is the snap-on meter um, and it's an extra credit thing so maybe not everybody wants to or needs to do it but if you do um, what I'd like you to do is shoot me an email um, uh, some of you guys that are brand new to the college I when I tried to look you up and snap on system you weren't there um, and that means I have to put you into the system and actually we have uh, Miss Andronis is our snap on website administrator so I have to contact her uh, with your information and get her to put you in the system so that you could get snap on certified on the meter. One thing that everybody can do though, to kind of see where they're at is um, you can take this quiz. Now um, this quiz is the snap on uh, practice test and it gives you a good idea of, you know, uh, your knowledge. And then some questions are specific to the snap on meter. Now, some of these ones you guys are going to know because they're, you know, they're basic to any meter, right? So like 
which which settings for continuity well a continuity test is a continuity test and they're usually drawn out the same way on all the meters it's under the ohms function so it would be c right so even though that's a picture of the snap-on meter that's a pretty uh easy one however there's some inside here that um are very specific uh to the snap-on meter let's see if i can find a good example of something that is uh, very meter specific. Um, okay, so this one, it says like the AC voltage signal is acting erratic due to electrical noise um, uh, interference. Uh, it can be smoothed out by the LPF function right that's a specific button on this meter that does a couple of things so um you know some of these questions see this one's again it's talking about the str button for for stroke is it two stroke or four stroke that's a specific thing to that meter so um this is a test that's open this test is also extra credit um but it's one of those ones where you can kind of see how well you do and if you want to take the time to really study up on all the snap on stuff and some of you guys, I, I've been looking at your histories of like when you're on the website and some of you guys have been doing this. So what you're going to probably want to do is you're going to want if, if you're passing that certification pretest, that extra credit pretest, if you're passing that pretest, this NC3, I guess I should call it NC3 pretest, if you're passing that with a 90% or better, um, then you probably do want to take this actual snap on certification test because you're likely going to pass that one too. So what do I need for that snap on certification test? Well, I need to get this account with NC3. And so, like I said, for some of you guys, when I go to NC3 certs, I don't have you in there. Um, and then rather than just add everybody in and start their account cycle, because it um, what I figured I would do is just, you know, contact me, let me know, hey, you want to be in the Snap-on deal? And I will then contact Jennifer Andronis and get you guys put into Snap-on's website and then um, open up the 596 multimeter certification. And like I said, really what you want to do is uh, get to the point where you can pass the pretest with a 90% with a or better because the actual test is a little bit harder than the pretest. Um, and then what's going to happen once we do get you in the system, it's going to be your school email. So it's your W and whatever your W number is, right? That's your login. And then everybody's password initially is, is password one, and that will get you into the system. And from there, you could change that once you're in the system. Um, but it, it gets you going and testing so you can take the test. And the website is NC3 certs. So it's not something that you have to do, but it's something that, you know, some of you guys might want to do for the extra credit points, or you might want to do it for uh, just for the knowledge itself, right? And, it sh and I have all kinds of video clips and everything in there that are all about uh, this, this meter. All right. Um, so with that, oops. I feel bad here. I'm showing a meter to the screen. Ah, I'm showing a meter to the screen and my camera wasn't on. I'm sorry, guys. I'm just I'm having an off day. I'll tell you, it's been it's been a long semester. I know I haven't been with you guys for a few weeks. Um, I'm doing some high school dual enrollment classes that are running me a little ragged. So all right. So it, all the snap on stuff is specific to the snap on meter. It's the 596. Um, you know, and it's Snap-on's equivalent to a Fluke 88, okay? All right. Um, so with that, uh, remember that as far as the modules go, once we get past halfway through the class, you know, I have, I have different video clips and all the PowerPoints from all like the Snap-on factory training and again, it's not a something that you have to do. It's more of a thing that you know maybe you want to do it if you want to get that certification. Remember, you can rack up a lot of points in the class that way. So if you miss some of the other assignments, 
this is a great way to make up some of that stuff. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to, you know, point that out to you again, what I need you to do is, um, email me. Some of you guys that were in there already, you were already in this, this, the NC three system. Um, most of you guys that were in the system, I already, uh, approved you. So you're ready to take the NC three, um, meter test. Um, but I might've missed somebody. So again, if you're having any problems with NC three or logins on the, um, I go back here on the snap on site, uh, you know, just, just shoot me an email and I'll, and I'll get that, um, put together for you. Okay. Um, so hopefully that, um, hopefully that makes sense, uh, there for you as far as finishing stuff out, I'll, I'll, I'll compile everything this weekend and kind of move stuff around and, and get stuff set up. Uh, I thought I would get that done today. And I had a couple of curveballs of um, some stuff with the schedule and we're working on a, um, a Toyota partnership. So you guys that have been with us uh, for several sem semesters, some of you guys like, like uh, Sam, you, you've been with us, you know, pre COVID. And, and so, you know, that we had a Subaru program and we had a, um, uh, a Chrysler cap program. Well, Toyota has approached us and I've been working on that Toyota partnership all day to give you guys yet another option um, uh, as far as certification. And they're supposed to promise uh, some some fresh cars for you guys to work on. And I'll tell you that the, the dealers are still all really busy. Like generally speaking, I'm finding that in the industry right now, um, the shops are still pretty busy now. If you guys have been reading, reading, reading the news, I'm going to put up here automotive. Automotive computer chip shortage. This is a huge, a uh, huge thing for our industry. And in fact, it's probably one of the biggest supply issues we've ever had or that I've ever seen. Um, in that, uh, we have this global computer chip shortage and we, we know, right. Cause be learning about cars, we know that a modern car is a computer network on wheels. Right. And so, um, everybody from Toyota to Volkswagen, um, there's just, um, uh, you know, there's just a, a huge shortage of, uh, computer chips. Uh, you know, we had factories in J Japan where, uh, you know, there, there was all kinds of damage and it's put us really behind the, uh, the they normally, cause you know, we're, we're about a month away from, uh, Memorial day, uh, weekend, right from, from a big holiday weekend where they would normally sell a lot of cars you know our our dealer um partners normally will have um something close like made a toyota will have something like 700 cars in in inventory getting ready for a holiday weekend and this year they have 150 or 140 or something it's just crazy how how down the industry is because the uh the supply is so low and that means that if the supply is down the course the demand is up and so what we're seeing is the prices for new cars are up and the prices for used cars are up so it's it's an interesting thing right now but all of them have uh busy service departments and they're all looking for for people so that bodes well for you guys. And if you happen to have a, a car right now, you want to sell it, you'll probably get more money for it because like I said, the used car market is pretty hot right now. Um, so I had a little case study that I wanted to get into that I used for um, my uh, scanner class. And in the scanners, we've been utilizing these inexpensive OED interfaces 
from that one, which works pretty good with Android phones, to probably my personal favorite, the the uh, Bicar one, which works good with with iPhones, but also will work with Android phones. Um, so it, it's kind of the jack of all trades. Uh, and we've been using a, a, a software platform called uh, Scanner ELM uh, OBD2, which is off of the old ELM327 interface uh, standard. So anyways, with that, we've been focusing on generic OBD2 diagnosis. And one of my big things about um, OBD2 diagnosis, if I kind of clean up this screen share a little bit, is that uh, when we're testing stuff with our scan tool, our scan tool is backdoor information. It's interpreted data coming from the computer where the stuff you measure with your meter, that's front door information, that's real, okay? So, you know, what we have here is, um, The stuff we test with our meter, that's real stuff where the stuff that we measure with our scan tool, our scan tool can lie to you. So I've been telling the students in the scanner class multiple times throughout the semester is that just having a scan tool does not replace your need to have a good multimeter and understand how to use that thing. All right, well, um, moving right, uh, moving right along. Um, uh, so here's some of the interfaces and of course we've been focusing on generic OBD2 and not the manufacturer specific side um, but there's still a lot of diagnosis that you can you can do with that now um, I'm going to skip some of the the uh, specific stuff there uh, that kind of bogs this down and try to get to what crosses over to the meter. And so again, I have here a scan tool does not replace your meter, nor does it replace the use of a lab scope, okay? What I presented to them was a, an eight step diagnostic process that really could be modified for just about anything, right? The first step says very verify the complaint. Well, you know, if it was just an electrical issue, the, the complaint could be something like, oh, the cooling fans don't come on, right? And then you're you're diagnosing that electrical problem, right? Verifying the complaint, do the fans really not come on? That type of thing, right? Um, so uh, kind of what we're doing here, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna go like this and I'm gonna say something different. I'm gonna say determine. Determine related symptoms. And that if you had a, a particular problem, what else is related to it, right? If it's a if it's a noise, you know, what else is related to that noise? Is it only on acceleration or is it only under braking? If it's an electrical issue, right? What other electrical circuits are related, right? A lot of times things will have a common fuse there, right? And see, what you'll notice is st we still have our pinpoint testing here, use of meters, scopes, that type of thing, right? So what I wanna do is run you through this, these eight steps and show you uh, the, the where the meter test kind of came in to show you that there's still, just because you have a scan tool, there's still a lot of value that, that you need for your meter because ultimately your meter is your pinpoint tool. In fact, um, what we like to say, if I, oh, I thought I had the slide and I don't. Um, what I like to say is that your meter is like your GPS that pinpoints exactly where you're at. The scanner is more like a compass. It kind of gets you close. So this is a case study that we did. This was off of my my uh, Suburban here. Um, it's a 96, which happens to be the first year of OBD2. 
It's got the 7.4 liter engine in it. So yeah, it does like to suck the gas. Um, it's an automatic with air conditioning. It's got an air injection pump and the complaint is that the mill is on. Now that's a fancy way to say that the check engine lights on, right? So any, any type of automotive problem, right? The customer's gonna bring you their car. They're gonna have a complaint, verify the complaint. Um, so we're gonna do just that. So we verified the complaint. Hey, the mill is on. It's a service engine soon right there. Uh, so I verified the complaint. The next step for scanner specific diagnosis is, hey, you, you go and you pull codes. And so here we're pulling codes with our little cell phone based OBD2 scan, generic scan tool. And we pulled a P0135. Now um, on this little app, where did we go to do that? We went to this little thing that said diagnostic trouble codes. We click that thing and this is what we got, okay? And I always say, hey, check for codes and check for pending codes as well, which we would do it both under this mode. Um, codes, pending codes are codes that have uh, been set, but they're not a full-fledged code and a pending code will not turn on the check engine light or the mill in, until it sees a failure uh, two consecutive times and then it becomes a full-fledged code. Anyways, so we pulled the code P0135 is a generic code for the heater circuit of our oxygen sensor. Now, with cars that are 96 and newer, with cars that are OBD2, you get a freeze frame. And a freeze frame is data there to help you basically figure out like how is the car being driven when the failure occurred, okay? So how is it being driven when the failure occurred? Well, this thing was starting to warm up. The engine's at 86 degrees, so it wasn't ice cold, but it certainly wasn't warmed up all the way. It looks like we fired it up and, you know, it was a, a cool Sacramento morning. So what we were, we were like maybe 50 degrees when it fired up, it's ran a little bit. That engine temperature has raised up to 86. Looks like we've thrown the thing in drive. We're just getting underway at 13 miles an hour. The engine speeds at uh, 1100 RPM and not a lot of load on the engine. We're, like I said, we're just kind of getting this thing going. 6% load, 20 grams per second on the mass airflow and bam, it pops this code. So at this point, if I had a scanner, I would be seeing if uh, there's anything, uh, you know, related in the data. So I went to the data. Does it support the code? And so what I did is because it was for bank one sensor one. So I put that up on my screen and I said, I'm going to graph them out against bank two sensor one and see if they look different. And so you can see here, I'm revving up the engine speed. I let it kind of do a nice smooth decel down. And, you know, both O2 sensors are switching you know, I don't know, maybe this one's a little slower. Um, it's a little bit inconclusive, okay? But again, this is a P0135, so it's not the O2 sensor failed its response time, it's that the heater circuit was having an issue, right? So, you know, whenever you get to a point in any diagnosis, you're like, hmm, I'm not sure, right? Well, it's time to review some service information. Now, now in our class, you guys have gotten uh, logins here to shop key pro and so this is what i did is i looked up this truck on shop key pro and went to circuit description and circuit description basically is how does it work okay and then this guy down here we have a fancy name for this in, in OBD2 terms, we call this enable criteria. So what is that? Well, this is the conditions necessary to set the code. 
And this tells you how that, that test is done for the computer to test out its O2 sensor heater. So it tells you a little bit about how the O2 sensor works. It also tells you that it needs to be 600 degrees Fahrenheit before that oxygen sensor is gonna work. That's why they put a heater in there because it gives you a faster sensor warm up time. So what does the computer look for? Well, the computer uh, determines it looks, um, it looks at the heaters operating by monitoring the amount of time. So basically you start it up and it's, it's counting the clock and it's seeing, well, how long did it take this O2 sensor to really start working? And if it takes too long, then it's gonna set this code, all right? What's the enable criteria? Well, battery voltage is steady. You know, and this gets us back to an important thing. Nine volts, but less than 17 volts, okay? And you'll pretty much find that sentence, that line in almost every OBD2 code. Um, and I bet it's programmed in OBD1 stuff as well. And, you know, earlier this semester, we talked about charging system voltage. Uh, we said it should be 13.8 to 14.8, right? So if you had, let's say, an alternator that wasn't working and the battery starting to get lower and lower and lower, that would prevent codes from being set. Also, if you had a alternator that was overcharging, maybe you had a high resistance on a uh, sensing wire to the voltage regulator or the voltage regulator was messed up or something um, and it was overcharging the battery, it would prevent any codes from any, any tests from running and therefore any codes from being set, okay? So again, it shows you how important battery voltage is for the whole scheme of things. Um, engine coolant temperature less than 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Hey, we saw that in the naval criteria, it was 86. Intake air temperature is less than 90 degrees as well. So it doesn't want it to be super hot outside. Again, we're testing the O2 heater circuit. So we wanna see something that it's cold outside or cool and we want it to heat up, right? It doesn't tell us how long it, it needs to run. Um, well, it tells us it needs to run greater than two seconds, but it doesn't tell us how long does it give the O2 sensor to heat up and start working? I, I know that's gonna be more than two seconds. Um, but basically these are the conditions necessary to get it to test that O2 sensor heater, okay? Now, why is that important? Because when I go back to my scan data, when I go back to my scan data, what I realized is, um, you know, at this point, the engine was already hot and the O2 sensors were hot. So that's why they looked pretty similar. I mean, yeah, you could say maybe this one's not switching as much as this one is right here. Right there, they look about the same. So this data is a little bit inconclusive, right? I'm not feeling real good about the big one sensor, but based off this alone, right? I can't say, oh yeah, it's definitely bad. The last thing I would want to do is throw something on somebody's car and then it still ends up setting codes and they come back and they're upset, right? So pinpoint testing time, guys. And that means we're breaking out our meter. We're breaking out our electrical meter. And we're breaking out our service information. Like I didn't want to wait, you know, if I, one thing I could do is I could wait till overnight and have the engine get completely cold and the O2 sensors get completely cold. And then when they're cold, I could compare sensor two to sensor one as they're still warming up. That would, that would help, help me figure out what's going on. But you know what? Even if I did that, even if I found that, hey, sensor one's kind of slow to warm up, well, that could still be maybe this 20 amp fuse is blown or missing, right? Maybe a wire is pinched. So it still brought me to pinpoint testing. So what I did is I said, okay, I'm gonna get out my meter. I'm gonna check this fuse and see what's going on here. Okay. Well, did I have to get in there and check that fuse? Notice that it goes to other heated oxygen sensors that seem to be working fine. So it's not likely that fuse. What I did is I went directly to the sensor and its connector and if you look at this guy, I should have 12 volts. So I'm going to put a positive there. 
and on the other side, I should have negative. So between terminals C and D here, I should have 12 volts. And guess what? I was measuring 12 volts right there, okay? So what that told me is that it appeared that the wiring up and to that point, the, the wiring on this side was, was good up to the sensor, okay? And I know it did make a signal so that made me feel that it was pretty good. The wiring between the sensor and the computer was also pretty decent, okay? So I'm really suspect of the sensor itself, but there is a way for me to pinpoint test and drive at home because once I take this thing out of the, the box and out of the wrapper, like I bought it at this point, right? So, um, you know, I like to be really sure that that is the problem before I start throwing those parts on the car. So here is what we did is we looked up uh, what's the resistance, what's the ohms supposed to be for my heater element inside my oxygen sensor. We looked that up. And from there, uh, we compared that to what we were measuring to what we, you know, actually uh, uh, what the specification was, right? So Again, it's a great example of your of your meter. Now, let me um, let me go through here, and I'm going to uh, change my screen share a little bit. It's going to get a little bit choppy, but what I'm going to do. Let's see here. Well, it's not letting me select what I want to select. Tell this is just one of these nights. All right. There we go. All right. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to end that task. Um, all right. So now you should see my screen. Um, and we are going to open up the document camera. And we're going to do a little um, O2 sensor uh, O2 sensor testing. There we go. Okay. So um, I have a brand new sensor here, and um, I, I it's a four wire. So basically, what you have here is you have power, and you have a ground. So you have power and ground. And then you have um, to your power and ground to your O2 sensor heater element. And then you have your signal and your uh, signal ground for your actual sensor. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this little meter. It's a little inexpensive meter here that I'm using with some of my high school students at Natomas. Um, and we're going to set this guy up to measure ohms. Now the spec is, you know, basically five to 15 ohms. So we're zero to 200. We're always going to take our leads and test them together to make sure we don't have a bunch of resistance in our leads. And it looks like I got a little resistance, 0.2 ohms, but that's not a ton. And then what I'm going to do to, to make it easier to get in there, to get to the connector is I'm going to use an alligator clip on one of my leads here just to help me make a decent electrical connection. And then when I do that, 
you can see a brand new sensor. Its heater element has 6.3 ohms of resistance. Okay, 6.3 ohms of resistance. What we had on the actual vehicle was several hundred ohms of resistance. And basically the heater element inside here, it just tends to, it just tends to burn out over time. Um, for air fuel ratio sensors, it's even worse because they run at twice the temperature. This guy runs at 600 degrees Fahrenheit. An air fuel ratio sensor is usually going to run somewhere around 1200 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so anyways, yeah, pinpoint testing definitely confirmed that the heater element of our O2 sensor was defective and we can feel really good about replacing this with a high confidence that that is the right repair. A couple other notes while I have you guys here. Um, you'll notice that this uh, O2 sensor is a direct fit. I don't have to like solder or crimp any wires. It's got the factory plug. That's really important. Um, I would say try to pick a good, uh, a good brand, right? Maybe a, a company that supplies the factory uh, with their O2 sensors or get one from, from the factory. Like it's definitely worth getting a direct fit sensor that's of high quality. These guys only produce a zero to one volt signal. So if there's any kind of a bad connection, that's gonna really mess you up, okay? Um, so, you know, while I have this little meter up here, one of the, my high school students found that there was something weird on this and I didn't notice it right away. But there it is right there. You guys can see where it says out right here and it shows almost like a little digital AC sine wave. So one of the things about an advanced meter like the snap on here is it does have the ability to measure other functions, right? Other functions such as uh, measuring things like uh, frequency and so what I'm going to do is I have this thing on out and I want to see, well, what's, what's coming out of this meter. So I'm going to take his leads and I'm going to plug him in to the snap on meter. And I'm going to turn him on. So you can see here that this guy's on this voltage out mode and uh, he is uh, sending out somewhere around 0.73 volts, but that's on DC right now, okay? And so, again, if I look at this signal right here, to me, this looks like an AC signal, alternating current. Meaning that, if I can get the... Yeah, it's a bad, it's a bad computer line. Let's try that again. AC signal, meaning that it's, it's going above and below zero volts. So here is zero volts. We're going above zero volts and we're going below zero volts like this, okay? And so our meter is measuring seven volts right now but that seven volts is really kind of taking like the average of these positive pumps right here, okay? So if I turn it to AC, now it's gonna take the average of the ups and the downs. So if I put it on AC, I should get, um, I should get a, a higher reading if this is truly AC voltage that's coming out of this meter. So let's try that. So to do that on this meter, I'm gonna hit the AC function. And what you'll see is AC comes up on the screen, okay? And now it's up to a little bit over two, right? So again, it's still an average, it's an RMS, root mean square average here. So the average of the peaks and the valleys is 2.2 volts, let's say, okay? So it's probably going up four to five volts up there. Now it's also gotta be switching back and forth, right? Because you have this repeating cycle. So from starting at the bottom, going up, 
then going down, that's one complete cycle, right? So, and a lot of times we'll, if I redraw this thing, what we'll do is we'll do one, um, one complete cycle like this. We'll say, okay, one up, one down, that's my one cycle. Well, how many of these cycles happen in one second? That is what frequency is all about, right? So let's see the frequency of these AC cycles coming out on this thing. I'm gonna move it right here to Hertz. Remember Hertz is a measurement of cycles per second. And so now I can check that out. Okay, so for this meter has this feature and I haven't quite figured out why you would need that feature to be honest with you, where it's gonna put out like a four and a half volt AC signal that's at 48, you know, just under 50 Hertz. Okay. And, uh, you know, I thought that, Hey, that's, that's kind of interesting. I don't know why this meter has that feature in the manual. It just says that this is a voltage output an AC sign output, which you, we could have got that from looking at the little picture, but I don't know what the intended purpose was. Um, however, uh, can you guys think of a reason why, you know, maybe that would be kind of a cool feature to, uh, to have, what do you guys think? Let me, while you're thinking about this, I'm going to change it back to the computer. We'll get rid of some of these scribbles and kind of clean, clean things up. Okay. Well, I'm messing with you, I guess. Um, but because it took me a while to think about, well, how, how could I use that? And um, a tool I used to have, and I dug around in my garage, I can't find if I loaned it out to somebody. A tool I used to have, well, this is, uh, those ones are much more high tech. Well, maybe just because my tool was 30 years old. Um, but I had a sensor simulator. And what it allowed me to do, remember how I said, like, you know, I didn't want to put the part on the car unless I was sure that the part was the problem. If you work at an independent shop, and this thing is way different than the one I used to have, but if you work at an independent shop, um, you know, once you take the part out of the box, uh, you've, um, you know, it, it, it's yours, right? So uh, what what my, my I want to say mine was OTC. Let's see if I can find it. Nope. Yeah, I don't know. Anyways, it allowed me to um, simulate various sensors on the um, on the vehicle by hooking up in their place, and I could put some stuff on there, right? So different sensors. Well, when I look at all these sensors, okay, one sensor kind of comes to mind uh, that's hard to simulate. Like a lot of these things I can simulate with the resistor, okay? I can actually use my body to simulate an oxygen sensor, uh, whether it's a one volt or a five volt. I can, I can use resistors to simulate things like intake air temperatures or coolant temperatures. But um, it's very difficult to simulate like a crankshaft position sensor. Well, if you happen to have a two wire crankshaft position sensor, guess what? This little meter that I wanna say was like $12 off of Amazon, this, this is a good simulator for a crankshaft position sensor. Um, 
So like if you didn't have spark and you didn't have an injector pulse and you thought, man, I, I don't think I, I don't think my crank sensor is working. Um, but, you know, you weren't 100 percent sure you could pl unplug the crank sensor, plug this guy in there in his voltage output mode and see and, and see, OK, do I have spark now? Because it would be giving you an AC style uh, crank signal now that would not work if you had a Hall effect. So it, you, you really have to have some sensor knowledge uh, to be simulating sensors, I guess, right? Um, e, T, E, K, C, I, T, Y. So there it is. There's that little meter right there. That thing is $10.49 and I, and I thought, man, just, for a basic meter to have around that's got pretty good insulation and stuff on it and uh, that has the ability to simulate a AC style uh, crankshaft position sensor or you could use it in place of a wheel speed sensor or uh, that's pretty cool. So anyways, I guess I'm getting sidetracked, but as you get into this more and more, you start finding other ways for other other tools to do, do what you want them to do. Um, so like if you weren't sure, hey, is it the ignition pickup or is it the ignition module? Well, one thing you could do is just replace both parts, right? And that's what a lot of guys do. But with the tool like this, you could simulate the ignition pickup and see if I gave it that signal and now it has spark. Okay, the pickup was the problem. But if it still doesn't have spark, then the module's the problem. So anyways, there's lots of ways to use meters uh, for pinpoint uh, uh, testing. So um, anyways, hopefully you guys got something out of that. And I wanted to use the Snap-on meter uh, through some of its paces um, to show you some of the other features of what it can do as far as measuring measuring frequency. That's, that's kind of a nice uh, feature to have certain times when you're doing diagnostics. So now let me go back to... Um, let me do this. Let me go back to I'm gonna change my screen share and we'll bring up our our class, but I'm also gonna bring back up our um, our diagnostic case study that we were looking at. Um, okay, and we'll change that screen share again so that we can actually see that case study. All right, so uh, with this, um, if we get all the way uh, to the bottom, you know, we did our pinpoint testing. You can see the resistance there uh, was pretty high. There's a heater element in the sensor, right? So, you know, when uh, when you're in the field, it's actually the changing of the parts usually is where you make your money. And sometimes it's kind of frustrating. Um, but that's just kind of how it works, right? Like a lot of times it's, it's way more difficult to diagnose what's wrong than it is just to change the part. But the way our billing and stuff works, right? What do you make money doing? Changing the parts. Um, so if you're ever like, well, what? Why, why are people inclined to throw a lot of parts on stuff? Well, because that's how you make your money, right? So anyways, um, all right, let's get that share going again. Um, all right, so put that thing on. Um, one thing I would recommend you guys do, no matter the, the issue, is that um, if you make a repair, always verify that your repair really fixes the problem. So I have verified the repairs for scanner stuff. It's at that point that I clear the codes. I don't clear the codes until I've already made my repairs. I meet my enable criteria. I perform a trip, which probably doesn't make sense to you guys if you're not with me on the scanner class. Uh, but that's all really important stuff to do in OBD2. Um, to get the computer, basically, you're trying to get the computer to test itself out again and make sure that we don't have pending codes. That, that everything tests out a-okay. 
Um, so I don't care if it's a cooling fan. You make sure that, hey, the cooling fan automatically comes on when it's supposed to, right? Whatever the repair is that you do, you know, drive the car in such a way that you're certain that you have verified that your repair uh, addressed that original issue, right? And that's how you're going to have a happy customer at the at the end of this thing. So, um, you know, that varies from job to job, right? It could be a test drive to make sure that there's no more noise. It could be, you know, uh, ch you, you've checked all the lights on the car. It really varies from repair, but you always want to verify that your repairs really do fix the problem, which sounds simple, but I can't tell you how many times where I see guys, they do a job and they think, oh yeah, it's fixed. They don't even check to see if it's fixed and they, you know, pull it out of their bay and they're on to the next one. And guess what? They either made a mistake or it didn't fix it or there's something else loose. So um, I'm just trying to get get that through to um, to you guys. So that was a pretty simple one. Had an effective oxygen sensor, pretty cut and dry. But again, I used my multimeter and my knowledge to really pinpoint test uh, and be sure about those those repairs. All right. So let's pull this thing back to our class and our web page. Um, you know, a few things that you'll have left uh, to finish out is the final exam. The our normal final exam, it's only 25 questions. And it's just a little bit of all the stuff we've talked about. I take a few questions from each quiz and put them on there. Um, we have the snap on meter activity and um, to do. And I, again, I just wanted to let you guys know Although you could do these things right away, what I'm going to do uh, for you procrastinators out there is I am going to make this um, where all these things get basically moved. I'm going to clean these up and move them to the end of the class, okay? Which our semester ends May 19th, so you'll have a little bit of time uh, to, to get that stuff done, or if you have some other classes and that are really busy and taxing your schedule or work's going crazy, you'll have time to wrap this stuff up, okay? A lot of these things are not required. A lot of these things are optional uh, extra credit bonus points. Again, if you're interested in doing the Snap-on NC3 certification that I have up on the screen and you're having some problems logging in or something, email me and let me know. Like I said, for some of you guys, um, if this is your first semester or maybe your second semester with us, um, we might not have you in NC3 yet. And I have to contact one of our other instructors to get an account initially created for you. And then once once I get that done, then I can assign you your, uh, your meter test, okay? And then as far as getting ready to take the meter test, remember what you wanna do is a bunch of practice on the on the practice NC3 pretest, not only will you get some bonus points for doing that, but that'll make sure that you're ready to pass the actual test that's in Snap-on NC3. One thing I didn't say, but it is here on the screen, is that you only get three attempts to pass that meter test on NC3's website. And the way it's locked out, like I can't even change that. So um, it's one of those things you wanna make sure that you're really ready and you're passing the pretest with 90% or better before you take the real test. Okay, so um, that test again will be specific to the SNAP on 596, which a good 80% of that is the same for just about any meter, right? It's measuring volts, amps, and ohms. And of course, you guys have learned this semester, the most common measurement that you'll do is, is measuring voltage drops, right? Like understanding how to read a wiring diagram and how to measure voltage drops. That's that's what it's all about, guys. Um, but this meter does have some additional features like it can measure RPM or temperature or, or frequency. And some of those things are kind of useful. There is some specific questions to those that you can get from the Snap-on presentations and, um, and video clips that I've loaded on our website for us. So, uh, you know, with that, I hope as you, you know, finish out your, your final exam and, and wrap up whatever assignments you have remaining that you've enjoyed the class, um, you know, and I, I look forward to having you in another class uh, in the future.